Well, today we're continuing a series of messages that we began last week on Resurrection Sunday called Because He Lives. So, last Sunday, today, and for the following two Sundays, we're going to talk about practical implications of the resurrection as relate to Jesus' work in our lives. And as Pastor Keith mentioned earlier, last week we talked about how Jesus, through the resurrection, it's confirmed that He gives us forgiveness of sins and a new life. And how we can rely on that, and the resurrection proves that. And today we're going to talk about another aspect of the work of Jesus in our lives that is vitally important that He died and rose to give us that we need to receive by faith. And in order to begin to talk about that, let's think about a series of questions. How many of us here today, how many of you raise your hand if you identify yourself as a follower of Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. Praise God. Praise God. How many of us, and we don't need to raise our hand, but how many of us, having said that and recognized that, realized that when we came to Christ that Maybe everything didn't work out exactly the way we expected. Maybe there were some surprises along the way. Maybe there were some difficulties we hadn't expected, and maybe there were some, even some weaknesses that we were disappointed in ourselves that we didn't realize we had or maybe thought we had abandoned. That was the case for me. I remember when I first came to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I was 10 years old, and I thank God for that experience of the new birth. And I was baptized, but I realized not long afterward that even as a believer, I still struggled with some sinful habits and weaknesses that I had had prior to even becoming a follower of Christ. And, and my life with the Lord was up and down. I was excited about going to church on Sunday, and, and that was a great thing. And I, I even as a 10-year-old, I, I remember coming to the front of the church and sitting on the front pew and taking notes on the pastor's sermon. Didn't have a clue what I was writing down, but I thought that was a good thing to do. And I remember being energetic, but then I remember later that week I would be at school or somewhere with my friends and I would be uh, laughing at the same dirty jokes that they told that I would laugh at before I came to Christ. And I would fall, find myself falling prey to some of the same temptations and the same weaknesses that I had before I came to know Jesus. And I was, however, at this point in time, much more concerned about that and more burdened and grieved by it than I had been before because I now had the Lord living in my life, making me sensitive to that in a way I'd never been before. And I was to some degree disappointed and even frustrated and borderline miserable. How many of us discovered that similar experience in our life when we came to Christ? Another question to follow up, does, does our behavior line up with Jesus in terms of this question? Does the way we treat other people help or hurt Jesus' reputation? You know, if you identify yourself as a Christ follower, then people who aren't followers of Christ, and those who are, but people who aren't especially followers of Christ, they get their opinion of Jesus from you and from me. So, does our life and the things that we do, does it communicate the truth about Jesus to other people? A.B. Simpson, the guy that we saw in the video referred to just a minute ago, that great line that we shared a few weeks ago in a sermon that bears repeating, A.B. Simpson said that, the Lord Jesus right now, as He sits at the right hand of the Father, is interceding for us. He is responsible for our reputation in heaven, and He has left us responsible for His reputation on earth. That's a great responsibility. What is other people's opinion of Jesus because of us? You know, I've heard missionaries uh, tell the story on more than one occasion who've gone to some of the most remote regions and remote peoples of the earth. And I've heard missionaries tell the story that that really the thing that, that made the change in their ability to be effective in their ministry was when people saw them behaving like the Jesus they had told them about. When people saw them treating them in the same way and acting like the Jesus they told about. In fact, there's one famous story of a missionary 
uh, many years ago who was in a remote tribal people, and the story was told that uh, he had come under great conviction because he had lived among these people for a couple of years, and because of their ways and his impatience, he would grow angry with them, and he would get mad at them, and he would do these things, and they all never received the gospel. And, but God got his heart, and he repented, and he came to a, a, a wholehearted devotion to Christ and, and was, was transformed. And, and he began to treat them like Jesus. And, and, the, and the tribal people told him, he said, Missionary, you've become a Christian. You know, as I, as I encounter people, as I hear of encounters, and as I myself experience interaction with people who aren't in church, in our region and around much of America, one of the constant, in fact, the most dominant reason that I hear from people that they don't choose to be a part of a church is not because they don't have a high opinion of Jesus. It's not because they don't think that Jesus is important. The typical response is they either knew somebody who went to church or they themselves went to church and they were treated in a way that was inconsistent than the Jesus they heard about. And they basically said, if that's what it means to be a part of a church and follow Jesus, then I don't need it. You see, so many times in our culture today, we... We talk about the, the sins of the culture and the media and, and we, we, we criticize the government and all these things. And I'm not saying that those aren't legitimate concerns. But you need to understand, if we look at the Bible, so go the people of God, so goes the world. We need to look in the mirror. The Bible says, let judgment begin with the house of God. Look at our own heart. How many of us discovered a long time ago that it's a lot more fun to confess other people's sins than our own? How many of us discovered that? You know, one of the most important prayers that the Holy Spirit ever birthed in me was that I be more upset with sin in my own heart than I am in anybody else's. That I hate the sin in me more than I hate it in anybody else. But isn't that typical many times of our life and our reputation? It's my prayer that nobody have a wrong opinion of Jesus Christ because of me or you or us together as El Tono Alliance Church. More than anything, deep in my heart of hearts as we brag on Jesus in everything we do, that collectively we accurately represent Jesus to other people that we accurately represent Jesus to other people. And the very heartbeat of our church is to be like Him. But is that possible? I mean, you're thinking, wait a minute, be like Jesus? I mean, you might as well tell me to be faster than a speeding bullet and leap tall buildings with a single bound. Well, let's look at the Bible. Read with me together 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Read that out loud with me. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. This is Paul, the apostle, speaking here. Understand, if you, if you know anything about the history in the New Testament, understand that Paul, the apostle, when we're first introduced to him in the New Testament, he was a persecutor of Christians. He actually helped to kill Christians. He helped to kill people because they were followers of Jesus and dared to identify themselves as such. This was a guy who was actively pursuing Christians to imprison and kill them because they identified with Jesus Christ. The same guy that did that is now saying to the church at Corinth, imitate me because I'm like Jesus. Wow! That's a 180, folks. That's a changed life. That is a radical transformation. Would you agree? 
And you know, my Bible says that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what that tells me is if He can do that in Paul, He can do that in me. And He can do it in you. And what we're going to talk about today is how? How? How does He do that? Well, let's begin by maybe letting the stained glass window up at the top of the room help us. You see that stained glass window, you see a cross, you see a pitcher, you see a cup, and you see a crown. And that, that stained glass window is representative of the full-featured work of Jesus in each of our lives. Last week, we talked about the cross piece. That because He lives, and through His death on the cross and the resurrection, we know that we can have forgiveness of sins. We, we can be right with God and one another. And then, and then we see, just beside that, we see a cup. And that cup represents a chalice, and it's representative, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that cup is representative of the juice that represents the blood of Jesus. The Bible says the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. So in other words, what that is referring to is Jesus as His work as the one who makes us holy. And the fancy word for that in the Bible is the word sanctifier. And understand that that word sanctify in your English Bible is just a verb form of the word holy. Now what is a verb? What kind of a word is a verb? It's an action word. So understand that that word sanctify in English is simply a translation of that word holy in a verb form originally in the Bible. So what it means is, is active holiness. Actively acting like Christ. So that's what we're going to talk about is how can he make us like that? How can he do what Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ? How could Paul be changed to act like Jesus? How can we be changed to act like Jesus? Well, three things that we're going to look at. First, as we begin, Ephesians 5.18, a verse that is familiar to many. Read it with me. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, there's an intentional comparison being made here by Paul to define what it means to be filled with the Spirit. He's using a person who's intoxicated under the influence of alcohol and comparing that to being filled with the Spirit. So, the analogy is easy. A person who's drunk is under control of the alcohol. A person who's filled with the Spirit of God is under the control of the Spirit of God. That means that it's possible for you and me to be absolutely under the control of God in our life. We can think His thoughts, we can react with His emotions, and we can have the power to do what He wants us to do. We can be controlled by Him. And we're going to see more of what that means specifically later as relates to the work of Jesus in our life. But the first thing to understand is that it's possible to be controlled by God. It's possible even though we are frail, even though we are weak, even though we are rebellious in our native state against God, all that summarizing what the Bible means when it says we're sinners, even though all that's true, God has made it possible to be controlled by Him and to act like Jesus. Wow, I don't know about you, but that's great news to me. That is the best news. Now, secondly, what's the second thing as to how we can be like Him? Well, to me, what is a foundational Scripture is 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now, what I want to do, I want you to read it with me. You're free to look it up. And by the way, all these scriptures should be referenced on your bulletin. And you can look them up at home and read them again. That's fine, because I'll be kind of going fast through some of the scriptures. 
Uh, sometime somebody told me in one of the messages, they said you need a pause button. <laughs> so you can read, you can look at those, you can look at those like. But this passage, and I've chosen a particular rendering, a particular version, because I like the way this says it, and to me it clarifies it really well. Let's read this together. May the God who gives us peace make you holy in every way and keep your whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you will do it because he is faithful. Notice what this, this prayer that Paul, what it's saying as he prays it for the Thessalonians. First of all, he's written the letter to the church at the ancient city of Thessalonica. He's speaking to people who, like many of you, who raised your hand earlier that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. He's speaking to believers. He's not speaking to people who don't, but he's praying for God to do something more in them than they've already had. So one, he's speaking to believers. Two, he's speaking for God, he's asking God to do this before the coming of Jesus. So that means he's asking God to do it now in their lives. Now in their lives. And he's saying, as we learn from other passages, when you were born again, when you came to know Jesus as your Savior, the Spirit of God came in you and gave you a new life and you were set apart for God. But he's saying, I don't want you to just be set apart in principle by the presence of God in your life. I want you to be actively holy. I want you to be set apart in everything you do in your life, even including your body and what you do with your body. I want you to be completely pure. You see, the idea of holiness is the word sanctify means holiness in action and practically speaking, it's a pure life. It's a life that's lived like Jesus, not like the world lives. That's what it means in practice. And he's saying, I want you to have that in a full measure right now. And they don't necessarily have it, otherwise he wouldn't have to pray for it. You don't necessarily have it, otherwise you wouldn't need to pray for it. You see, what we need to do, secondly, is we need to trust God to make us completely holy. We need to recognize, you see, that Jesus just didn't die to give us a fire insurance policy against hell. Jesus died to give us a life assurance policy that starts right now. And those sinful habits that have held you down, and those attitudes and those actions that have not been what God wants, you don't have to be enslaved to them. You can be free. Jesus can set you free. You see, forgiveness is deliverance from the penalty of sin. Holiness is deliverance from the power of sin. He's praying for them to be delivered from the power of sin. You see, the result is a pure life with victory over temptation. What he's talking about here is not instant maturity, but instant purity of heart, of motives, of will. As long as we're in this life, we're still going to have weaknesses and frailty. But we're talking about a purity of heart that's, that's cleansed of self-centeredness and rebellion and hatefulness, but of love for God and others. I love that story of the two brothers. To me, it expresses it well whose father asked them to go down to the well and get a bucket of water. And they had a big five-gallon bucket. They were young fellows, and that bucket was half the size of the two young boys. And so one brother went down to the well to fill up the bucket. The other on the way down decided that some of his friends were doing something that were more fun. So he just decided, I'll get the water later. So he just went the other way, didn't even fill up his bucket. The other brother filled his bucket. 
And he tried to bring it to his father, but the bucket was so full and so heavy, he couldn't even lift it. So he just tried to drag it, and the bucket bounced around along the ground, and you know what happened. The water sloshed out before he got to his father. But, but even though neither brother brought his father a bucket of water, one brother obeyed and the other disobeyed. And you see, what holiness is, is our desire as we reach out to God with a pure heart to honor Him, then He tells us to go down to the pond to get a bucket of water. But what He does is He comes alongside and grabs the handle with us. And He picks it up and together we bring the bucket back full. And as we turn to God and we seek Him to trust Him for all that Jesus died to give us, then in the fullness of His Spirit, He empowers us. You see, it's not a question of do you have the Holy Spirit. If you're a believer, the difference between, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, the difference between people who are truly born again and children of God and those who aren't is the presence of God's Spirit within them. That's the difference. The question is not if you're a believer, if you have the Holy Spirit. The question here is, does the Holy Spirit have you? You know, I told the story earlier about my experience up and down like a yo-yo as a young believer and my frustration with my inability to overcome some of the temptations that I'd had before. I'll never forget that night at 13 years old that I was with our youth group we, at the church and we went to a, a Billy Graham meeting. And I remember that night as I walked down from the cheap seats up in the nosebleed section of that large basketball stadium and I went down to the floor and I prayed with somebody there on the floor and from that night to this day there hasn't been one day that I have not consciously walked with Jesus. Now I didn't know what happened. I didn't, thank God you don't have to make an A on a theology exam to have a life with God. I can tell you now what God did because I've studied and I've learned. But what God did in me that night is He filled me with the Holy Spirit. And He set me apart and empowered me. The prayer of Paul for the Thessalonians was answered in my life that night. By faith, Christ did it. Because I gave all of me for all of Him. And He honored it. And He'll do the same for you. He'll do the same for you. You see, the ability to obey the great commandment of love. You see, we have the ability to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbors ourselves. Jesus said those were the most important commandments. You see, it's not perfection or painless, but it's purposeful and powerful. It doesn't mean that life all, become, all of a sudden becomes a breeze but it means that all of a sudden you have a power to live above the obstacles that you never experienced before. I love that great promise in 2 Timothy 1.7. How many of you know that promise by heart? A few. I see a few. You need to know. Everybody needs to know. You need to know these promises. You need to be in a position to claim them when you need them. Greatest thing to pray for one another. These promises. Great promise, 2 Timothy 1.7. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Hallelujah. I claim it because the Spirit of God is in me, and I claim His power. I claim His fearlessness. I claim His love. That's the great promise. Now, first, be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Second, trust God to make you completely holy. Purify your heart. Now, the third thing, I'm going to read several passages. Don't look, these are mentioned in your bulletin. You can look them up. I don't want to confuse you. Just listen with me, these passages that I read. And let's see the third thing that really is the exclamation point on this. In John 14, Jesus was talking with the disciples around the table at that supper, at the Last Supper. And Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and He will give you another Helper, that He may abide with you forever. 
the spirit of the truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Spirit's going to be in them, right? Listen now. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He just told them he was going away. What, what are we talking about? He's going to send the Spirit, but I'm going to come to you. A little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and listen, I in you. The Spirit's coming to be in them. We learn later in John 16, Jesus says the Spirit will not speak on His own initiative, but He will take what is mine and give it to you. What Jesus was saying was this, in the person of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune Godhead, the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was going to come, but He was not going to bring just Himself, He was going to bring Jesus. So Jesus came to live in them in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, listen. That doesn't end it. To understand and confirm that, listen to Paul's words in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I, he says, have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, he's explaining exactly what Jesus predicted. That's the reason Paul was transformed from a person who killed Christians to a person who says, watch me because I'm following Jesus. You want to act like Jesus, act like me. That's how he was transformed, because Christ was living in him by the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on in Philippians 4, he says... I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How would he be able to do all things through Christ who strengthens How would Christ strengthen him? Because he lives in him. He is his life. He is his strength. And then 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? In other words, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, the evidence of whether or not you're truly born again is whether or not Christ lives in you. And do you know that or not? And then Colossians 1.27, To them God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, the common denominator in all these passages and dozens more, we don't have time to read them, is that the reality of faith and life with God is that when we turn to Jesus and we call out for God to forgive us and deliver us from His wrath and punishment for our sin based on what Christ has done, then through the person of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ comes to take up residence in our body. So how can we be like Jesus? We need to remember that Jesus lives in us. How can I know that I can resist temptation? I can't. Can you on your own? No. But the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Jesus can. Christ is in me, so I can. And he has shared his life with those who trust him. How does that, I'll tell you what, if that doesn't excite you, you need to wake up. Hallelujah! That's great news! God has a life for me I could never dream possible, all because of Christ. You think Jesus had a life that was meaningful, purposeful? <laughs> I think he may have. That's, that's a rhetorical question. <laughs> Does anybody else want that kind of life? <laughs> oh, hallelujah! What a Savior! Listen. In just a few minutes, when we finish, you're going to, I want you, this morning, you come, there are going to be elders here at the front, you come and pray. If you don't know for sure, just like I did that night when I walked down from the nosebleed section of that stadium, <laughs> I want you to come and pray, just like I did that night. You pray and ask God to fill you. You know why we can be confident that the Lord will do this? Jesus in Luke 11, when he was talking to the disciples, 
teaching them how to pray. He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Surrender your life today and open your heart to all of Jesus for all of you. See what He does in your life. Try Him out. Remember that Jesus lives in you and He has the power to take us to victory. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. How many of you as Christians, many times, you sit there and you go, man, I, I just, I'm really struggling. It looks like those people who don't follow, they're having all the fun. I'm just upset because I can't, you know, oh, it's okay, I'll excuse this. I can watch this, I can watch this movie with all this profanity and all this nudity. And all. It's not, you know, it doesn't matter. How, how many of you Christians, you have no victory? You have no conviction? You're miserable? Well, I've got to go to church today. I reckon it's Sunday. I've got to go to church again today. I hate to... Listen. You're the very person I'm talking to today. You're the very person Christ is talking to today. That's not God's will. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You need to learn the joy that Christ has. You need to learn the excitement that He has. You need to learn the power that He has to live like Jesus wants you to live. And He has it for you. And I thank God in His wonderful mercy, He exposed me to it when I was 13 years old. And I regretted not believing it earlier. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hush. But because He lives, He can change you to be like Him. He can do it. He will do it. He did it for Paul. Radical. Same yesterday, today, and forever. He's alive. He's here. He'll do it. Listen, don't let one drop of Jesus' blood be wasted on your life. Don't let one drop of Jesus' blood be wasted. Oh, I thank Him for the changes He's made in me. I thank Him for the hunger that He gives me for His Word, desire. That's all of God. That's not of me. You know, sometimes after having been a Christian for many years, I take it for granted. I look back and, and, I, and I see how I, I take for granted what He's done. And I forget where I came from. Anybody else ever do that? I forget where I came from. And then all of a sudden, the Lord in His mercy brings back, flooding back the memories about my old wicked heart as a young boy. And, and, and where that would have led me had the Lord not rescued me. Because it had already taken me far enough I was somewhere I didn't need to be. And you need to understand that God wants this for you. It's not just Paul. It's not just me. It's, not, it's for everybody. God wants it for you. God wants to use you to change the world. You know, last night, I'll share this, and, and, then, and then I'll promise. I told you I'd hush a minute ago. I'll promise I'll be still. But, you know, just last night I was talking. Amazing what we have these days with Skype and all the things. My, my cousin, I've told you about before, is 60 years old, retired ag teacher, high school teacher. He's recruited to go to Afghanistan as a civilian. He's there with the Army at a forward operating base in Afghanistan. And he, he's got a, inter, a satellite thing. I can talk to him over Skype. He said the other night he was awake and there was artillery fire. And he, it was a new experience for him. Pray for those folks. But you know what? Here he is over there. He went over there to teach ag, but he, he felt like God had called him and he teaches Sunday school back at home. And So he started a Sunday school class there on the base. And there's 15 soldiers that come to his Sunday school class. And he said, just this week, there was one of the soldiers who didn't want anything to do with the Sunday school class. They were out on a mission. He was in full battle gear in the back of a military truck in Afghanistan. He told one of his fellow soldiers, I need Christ. And they prayed, and he received Christ right in the back of that truck on a mission in Afghanistan. Now, my point is, my cousin didn't go over there to preach. He just went over there to teach agriculture, but he just... Was trying to be faithful to what he thought. God wants to do the same with you, with me, with all of us. And he will. 
thank you Lord, that you come to live in us and that you're willing to change us from somebody we don't even want to be <laughs> to who you are. You give us your heart, your mind, your emotions, your will. Oh Lord, I pray that none of us here today will let your resurrection go unclaimed in our life. Fill us with. Amen.